Our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Simon Jones. So Dr. Jones is a staff emergency physician at St. Paul's Hospital and is fellowship trained in ED ultrasound. Outside of medicine, he can be found in the mountains suffering for the sake of updating his Instagram account. But here to talk about necrotizing fasciitis in the ED, please welcome Dr. Jones. Thanks guys, thanks Brian for uh, allowing me to speak today. Hopefully I don't embarrass you. Um, I'm gonna be just kind of highlighting some updates in necrotizing fasciitis for you guys. And there we go, I don't have any conflicts as well. Uh, whoa, back. Here are my objectives. Um, so really I just wanna kind of go over the diagnosis and management of necrotizing fasciitis. Um, hopefully you guys learned something today. Uh, in coming up with this presentation, I wanted to come up with some sort of theme for this uh, that kind of ties this all together, but I couldn't, so I came up with this. Um, this is Batman, uh, and some people out there don't believe that Batman is truly a superhero because he doesn't have any superhuman kind of qualities. And a lot of people actually believe he's more of, a, as a, more of a vigilante. And as an emergency physician that works in this chaotic environment that we do, I kind of identify with this. So today we're gonna give you a guide to fighting necrotizing fasciitis like a superhero. Uh, this is my summary slide. So this is kind of comes at the end, but I thought I'd highlight it at the start. So today I'm just gonna provide some steps that allow you to kind of hopefully identify necrotizing fasciitis early on in the presentation and then get management started. At the end of the day, the key to this is that this disease is still a clinical diagnosis. And if you're working up a patient and there's any point where you think that they might have neck fasci, you gotta get the surgeon involved as soon as possible. So to start, step one is you have to understand it. In order to understand it, um, you really need to, to understand the anatomy and how this disease kind of progresses. So the, the arrow's pointing at the deep fascia here. And, and what you'll see is that um, the deep fascia is quite deep to the skin. It's also an area within the anatomy that doesn't have a great blood supply. And this is important, right? Because when uh, the bacteria gets into this zone, it actually creates a delayed immune response. And this allows the bacteria to kind of travel up the fascial layer like really quickly without the body kind of fighting it off. At the same time, it actually will cut off those feeding arteries, and that's what leads to the necrotic features we see in necrotizing fasciitis. But oftentimes, those features that we're looking for so closely, you can't see early on in the disease. So you gotta keep that in mind when we're trying to figure out how to diagnose this uh, disease early on. There's two main types in necrotizing fasciitis. Type one is polymicrobial. This is a combination of aerobic and anaerobic mechanism, or organism, sorry. Um, this is like, this is the most common one, presents like 80% of the cases are actually like this. This is the old individual with mul multiple comorbidities that comes into the eMERGE. As opposed to type two, this is the one we hear in the news, right? This is only about 20% of the cases, and this is that group A strep, that like young, healthy 20-year-old falls off their bike, ends up in the eMERGE the next day, gets flesh-eating disease and loses their leg. So we don't actually see this one as much, but we definitely hear about it a lot more. So what's happening here is that these individuals that are otherwise healthy, healthy are colonized with this bacteria in their oropharynx. They have some sort of muscle strain or they, go, they kind of have some sort of trauma and then the bacteria actually spreads from the oropharynx through the bud and then deposits itself in the deep fascial layer and that's where it starts to spread. This is also a very rare disease. Um, this is the latest update we have on cases per year in Canada. I think this actually underestimates the true number. Um, but at the end of the day, it's rare. It's not something we see very often. It's something maybe you'll never see in your emergency department. But we need to keep this in mind because it still has a pretty high mortality rate. So the step two is we need to think about it, right? Because it's rare, we might not always be thinking about it. And if we don't think about it, we're gonna miss this as part of our diagnosis. So we have to have a high index of suspicion because there are estimates that when the patients present early on in this disease process, we might miss it up to 100% of the time, which isn't good, right? And if we miss it, then we're gonna delay surgery and these patient outcomes are actually gonna be worse. So step three is, well then how do we identify it? So hopefully I can kind of give you some skills or something that will help you kind of identify this kind of early on in the disease process. I think when we see a picture like this, we see the necrosis, we see the bulli, and it kind of 
on our differential diagnosis, we're going to be thinking about uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Similarly with this picture, you know, it might be a little bit more subtle, but again, there's some classic findings to suggest that this is neck fasci. So we're all going to kind of think about this. However, most patients that come in with necrotizing fasciitis to the eMERGE won't have these classic findings. And so that can kind of trip you up, right? They might actually present with something that looks a little bit more like this. And we might just think that this is like an aggressive cellulitis or erysipelas or maybe venous stasis dermatitis. Brush it off, send them to our outpatient antibiotic therapy clinic and you know, not think about it again. But the fact is, is that a lot of these patients might actually present with something more along the lines of this. So in order to identify that this is neck fascia, not the cellulitis, again, it comes back to that anatomy, right? This is a deep infection that, that progresses along that deep fascial layer, and we might not see the skin findings early on in this disease process. So we gotta think about other things with these patients. The first is we gotta think about pain out of proportion. If somebody's coming in with severe thigh pain and we don't know why they have that thigh pain. Similarly, they have severe groin pain. We can't really see anything, maybe a little bit of a redness that looks like an early soft tissue infection. That might clue us into the fact that this is actually neck fashion, not one of those other diagnoses. Similarly, this is a big one that a lot of people don't think about is this pain or paresthesias outside the erythematous margin. Again, if we, if we come back and we think about that anatomy, right? So as the disease progresses along that fascial plane, we're gonna have a delayed response within, that we see in the skin, right? So the skin might actually be red at some point. But the disease might have actually moved past that point. So in these patients, if we examine them beyond the erythematous margin, what we might find is that the skin is actually quite tense. When we push, the patient might complain that there's a different sensation there, and they also might find that it's extremely tender. So this can clue you into the idea that this might be neck fascia versus something else. Another way to think about this is to think about this disease progressing in kind of zones. So zone one is that area where the infection started, right? And in this, this area, what we're gonna be looking for is those classic signs of necrotizing fasciitis, the bullae, the ecchymosis, the crepitus. But if that's not there, then we look into zone two. And zone two will be that pain out of proportion, right? So it looks like maybe it's just a mild cellulitis, we touch it and they like jump to the ceiling. If we don't see that, then we move on to zone three, and that's just analyzing outside of those erythematous margins to see if there's anything there as well. The other thing that we know about is that if this is a severe like group A strep, it can have quite rapid progression, so that should highlight to you that this might be neck fash. And then lastly, these patients might, will usually be clinically unwell. Now, some of them might be clinically unstable, especially if they have the group A strep, because about 50% of those patients will present in toxic shock. But most of our patients that we see won't be in a shock state, will actually just be kind of unwell. And one of our colleagues recently said it well, that if your patient is asking you to go for a smoke while you're examining them, it is unlikely that they have neck fash, right? They're not gonna wanna leave their bed. Maybe at St. Paul's it might be a bit different. <laughs> We also have to ask the right questions, especially in type one uh, neck fascia. These patients are gonna have um, multiple comorbidities such as diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, it might be immunocompromised, have a history of alcoholism. So that should, that should help you out. And then similarly, if we ask about trauma, about a quarter of the patients will actually give us a history of trauma. Um, so whether that's falling off a bike, whether that's some sort of muscle strain, a lot of these patients will have some sort of inciting event. And lastly, we gotta ask about NSAID use. There is a strong correlation between NSAIDs and necrotizing fasciitis, especially in patients with a varicella infection. And this is one of the main reasons why we don't prescribe NSAIDs for kids with chickenpox anymore. And then we gotta think about the differential diagnosis. This is a picture of uh, pyoderma gangrenosum um, and there's tons of case reports out there of patients presenting with something like this, the doc thinking that it's neck fash, sending them to the OR only to find out that it's pyoderma gangrenosum. So we have to think about these other, uh, different, these other things on our differential, but again, you know, we have to put the whole thing together in order to diagnose our neck fash cases. The next step is confirming it. 
Before we get to our investigations, again, we need to stop and think about that this is truly still a clinical diagnosis. So at any point in our workup, if we're like, oh man, this sounds like neck fash, you gotta call your surgeon and get them to come down. As they're coming down, then maybe you can get your lab work, your blood culture, start your antibiotics, and get the further imaging. But in the, in the meantime, you can't delay referring these patients to surgery. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you're in this, this situation where it's still not quite, you're not quite sure if this is neck fascia or it's something else, then labs do help, and the evidence suggests this, right? So we're gonna order our regular kind of uh, blood panels. We're gonna look for that really high CRP as well as white blood cell count. But at the end of the day, we have to keep it in mind that labs, the labs can only support our diagnosis, but they can't make it, right? So in 2004, there was a study published um, looking at the laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing fasciitis. And this was supposed to be like a bunch of tests or a bunch of lab work that we put together, created a score. The higher the score, the more likely it was that you had neck fasci. Now, at the end of the day, this study um, has found that in, in post kind of validation studies that it's just really not a good indicator. And it's probably not something that we should be using on a regular basis for the diagnosis of neck fascia. And it definitely doesn't uh, supplement or supplant um, a clinical diagnosis. That being said, some studies that came out in the past couple years suggest that if the LRINIC score is greater than, se greater than or equal to seven, that it, it does actually strongly uh, predict necrotizing fasciitis. So if you're gonna use it, make sure that you're, you're looking for a really high score before you're talking to your surgical colleagues. In the future, you might see a modified LRINIC score. And this is interesting because it actually combines qualitative and quantitative findings. So it combines things like pain out of proportion with a really high CRP to create a number. And this has been shown to actually improve our sensitivity uh, and positive and negative predictive values when trying to diagnose this. So this is something you can just definitely kind of keep your eyes open to. Next is imaging. Um, I think that most people, in this case, if we're not sure, will get a CT scan, and I think that's, that's the right thing to do. CT scans are fairly easy to get in most major centers. They don't delay care too much, um, and they're actually pretty good at diagnosing neck fascia. However, similar um, to the studies looking at pulmonary embolism, the use of CT scan actually hasn't been shown to improve outcomes. And the thought is, is that by getting a CT scan, we're actually delaying the diagnosis and delaying our surgical consultation, then that could have that negative impact. Similarly, with MRI, um, it's not super readily available. It takes a long time to get. And at the end of the day, it might actually overestimate the diagnosis of neck fascia. So again, not really recommended. And the last one that's come up recently is the point of care ultrasound. Lots of case reports out there of patients being diagnosed with neck fascia, even with like a normal CT scan or MRI. So it can be really good. And I'll touch on a couple, couple things here. So the first thing is, is that we're gonna be looking for air scatter if we're putting the ultrasound uh, on this patient. Um, here what you see in the picture is you see this cobblestoning appearance. You can see that in cellulitis as well. Um, so don't get tricked into thinking this is a cellulitis or a vice versa. Below that in the deep fascial layer, what you see here is this air scatter. And that's a subcutaneous emphysema. And that is neck fascia until proven otherwise. Similarly, we're gonna be looking for fluid along that fascial plane. On the left side, again, we're seeing that cobblestoning features, which can be in cellulitis, but below we're see seeing normal tissue. On the right picture, we're seeing a whole bunch of fluid above and below the fascial layer. If there's fluid that's greater than five millimeters above that fascial plane, it is indicative of necrotizing fasciitis. On top of that, if you're seeing fluid above and below, that's something called the dirty fascia sign. Again, that's indicative of necrotizing fasciitis and can help with your diagnosis. The last thing is once we have the diagnosis or tie in our list, we gotta treat it. Treatment hasn't really changed too much. The first thing is antibiotics. So we want something that's gonna be broad spectrum, combined with something that's gonna cover for MRSA, and then the last thing is adding in clindamycin in order to deal with those toxins that are released from strep and staph. And then surgery. So the sooner the better. All the research has said this forever, right? The faster we get these guys to the OR, the better these guys do. And the last thing is, is this, in regards to surgery is, if at all possible, don't transfer the patient out. If your site is capable of managing um, neck fast surgically, then don't transfer out, because that delay in transfer actually worsens outcomes. Some other things that always get asked about is IVIG. Right now, in the eMERGE, is it helpful for neck fascia? Might be in the ICU, 
Similarly, with hyperbaric oxygen, uh, oxygen therapy, again, in the ED, don't need to worry about this. Might have some benefits down the road in trying to be some sort of like limb sparing uh, modality, um, but our surgeons can deal with that. And lastly is prevention. So, you know, some of these cases are gonna have a very virulent strain of group A strep. And so if your patient is diagnosed with neck fash, we need to identify that and then um, make sure that they're close contacts, especially those that are immunosuppressed or um, are high risk for infection, so really young, really old, are prophylactically treated with some penicillin for a week. So just to summarize, um, I still think that neck fascia is truly a clinical diagnosis. And if it's on your differential and it's high on your differential, get surgery involved early. Some things to watch out for might clue you in that this is neck fascia. Again, the pain out of proportion or the pain or paresthesias outside the erythematous margin. And then if you don't know, then start the antibiotics, start your investigations, and closely observe. Thank you. We're on time? Yeah.